This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Storyblocks. Every creator should try a Storyblocks membership. They make it really easy for you to bring all your stories to life without having to worry about adding extra time, budget, or resources. Storyblocks is an ever-growing library of over 1 million high-quality, royalty-free stock assets, including 4K footage, music images, Premiere Pro, After Effects templates, and more. You can even use Storyblocks if you're a member of a large creative team or marketing marketing agency. Learn more and try a subscription today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Once again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. Hey, let's start the show for Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Nope, no music. Dot com. Let me see if I can add that music and let's see if it plays. Well, pardon the early technical difficulties with the show. You can tell that I'm finally suffering the effects of dad baby two double dadding i don't know what is it what does it call when you have a second child what is it i think it's just dad brain still dad, dad brain uh, i think it's very clear that yeah. you have dad brain oh my god so we we calculated this on the show dad parent brain you know obviously it's, it, if we are sharing the load I, I would argue even that danica is taking more of the load doing the feeding and the nursing and and a lot of the shouldering of the responsibilities a lot of the responsibilities most of them uh but parent brain takes away like 10 20 percent of your you know structural cognition right with the first child that's how that's that's basically an end memory that's my experience i woke up this morning i struggled to 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 come up with what day of the week it was like really really struggled and yeah i i'm really feeling it <laughs> seems about right have you been able to keep up with all the news because this is for once a pretty heavy news week yes and most of that is catching up you know late into the evenings uh, i have a running list that i make throughout the day of all the things i have to do uh, when both the babies are, uh, the baby and the toddler are asleep, and is a long list, but thankfully, you know, I I I, I, I find ways to to fit the puzzles together. Uh, Kishore, thank you for joining me this week. Jeremy is off this week with some deadlines, so we have a duo cast. But you're right, there is a ton of stuff to talk about this week. But first of all, how are you doing? How uh, are we on track? I think last last week when we had Will on, you had not gotten. Your shot yet, and are, are, are my we? My uh, status has changed. Your status my, has changed. Ooh. Like my status, it's complicated now because I am I am uh, completed one dose of two, so I'm I'm en route. I can also confirm that I also have completed one dose of two. So uh, uh, once Jeremy gets his, you will be correct. Your your uh, your prediction of us having our shots by May first, at least the first shot. I knew it. Well, I. Is this inside info or is the confidence in in the the, the system? I just I'm never wrong about <laughs> about these things. Well, I'm glad you weren't wrong here. Uh, I had no real side effects. You know, a numb arm. A, a it really just felt like you know a 300 pound person punched me in the arm really hard, uh, up and down the arm. And you know, that's, you know, if that's the worst I have to deal with for the first shot, then not not a big. Uh, deal, but we did have um, a big uh, key- keynote announcement. It's, you know, it's it feels like it's a little bit almost like back to normal. We get Apple events. There's a big Oculus gaming showcase that's literally going on as we're we're talking, uh, recording the episode. You know, it feels a little bit more like the world's going back to normal. Although, obviously, a lot of stuff happening in the world, as John Oliver put it, it does shit's terrible. But this episode, this podcast, uh, hopefully, will give us a little bit of a reprieve from that and. To bring a little bit of entertainment and information to you. So shall we get right to it? Shall we get right to top story? All right, here we go. Let's top do it. story. Top story this week. So what do they call this event? Spring loaded. Spring loaded. Spring loaded. 
we knew. Can, <laughs> can we actually start fr- in a in a different way? Can we start from my order of what I th- thought was the most important announcements from Sh- Apple? You, you can are, judge yes. me silently. No, 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 no. I, I'm not going to judge you because one, you're, you're we know you are the resident non Apple iPhone user at least, right? You use uh, mm-hmm. an Android phone. You're actually using the new One Plus, the One Plus phone, um, and also. Uh, I will say this event, it's a spring event, so it's not an iPhone event. So it's more about like their ecosystem. It's not WWDC, so it's not software-based. But I'm curious, you know, of all the things, because there were many, many things that they announced uh, yesterday as we are recording this, what were the things that were interesting to you from your perspective? Okay, I'm going to start with what I thought was the most important announcement, and it's only because we are living still in a pandemic. Ted Lasso returning July 23rd, number one, uh, uh, because it was the best show I saw last year. And so I was really hyped to see that. I I know that's a little snarky, but I I do think it's like legitimately my favorite show of the last year. So um, I kind of got out of my seat for that one. And you could argue maybe the only bright spot in the Apple TV Plus subscription lineup in terms of for all the hundreds of millions of dollars they put into investing in that ecosystem and all the free subscriptions they got and the extended free subscriptions for people buying their hardware. Ted Lasso is the only one that really broke into pop culture consciousness, the right timing, the perfect writing, uh, and they gave an ample amount of time announcing that in fact they even leveraged ted lasso himself to announce a new product for them like that's how in the family that's how important ted lasso as a pillar of their subscription you know uh, uh, strategy going forward is but yeah i I think that's it's probably the only reason people are i mean is that it's, it's not even available for a la carte purchase you have to subscribe to get it yeah, absolutely. But it, it does lead into what I thought was the mo- the second most interesting announcement of, of the event, which is the Apple TV 4K. Uh, and it's for two reasons. So, so I do think the upgrade with the, the chip um, is, is uh, fantastic, but it's really the remote. It's not. Holy the, crap. The, <laughs> you're being generous by calling it fantastic. Remote. Yeah, it's the remote. <sighs> it's the remote. Like, I, and they didn't do anything that complicated. They just did the things people have asking for for a long time. Power button, mute button, uh, and then like an actual physical button click that still maintains their like, oh, we, we you can sort of jog the circle and still do some fast, fast things. But it's just a normal remote now. And everyone's like, hallelujah, I'm going to purchase this. And, and honestly, I thought it, it was the the best uh, improvement on a product that they announced uh, at the event, uh, simply because of the remote, and that's that feels like a slight, but it's not. I, I do think this is really hitting a sweet spot for them. You called the new processor in there, which is it's their A12 chip, so it's not even the the M1 stuff. It's you know purely an A stuff. Although it does feel like they're starting to move their their iOS uh, hardware onto uh, M1 platform. It's all their ARM internal ARM systems, right? But A12 Bionic on the Apple TV, what does that even get you, right? Still, still 4K. They're not talking about anything more than 4K. You don't need anything more than 4K. The existing Apple TV 4K did everything fine. Like you're gonna maybe get better performance in, in games for people who play games on Apple TV. All oh, how many of you? Not that many, right? Um, even though arcade was a big thing, and arcade is really a, a touch screen. It's an iOS uh, platform, subscription g- gaming platform. Anyway, um, you get HDR video at a higher frame rate. So HDR already, Dolby Vision already performed fine on the Apple TV 4Ks uh, for high frame rate. There's no real high frame rate HDR content out there. You're going to get maybe better airplay. So the new phones, 12 Pros, can record in HDR and record at HDR 60 FPS. So to get that playback on airplay may be the only thing, only real benefit from a hardware perspective. I, I don't think that's a small thing, improving AirPlay, because that that was a big complaint amongst many Apple TV users. The thing I'm intrigued by, and intrigued is the right word here, is the color balancing uh, that they showcased. Now, normally I would have rolled my eyes at this, but I do think I, I, somebody that got a new TV not too long ago and spent way too much time like calibrating and configuring it 
Um, I do wonder how many people are actually going to utilize this feature. Now, the whole thing about like, use your phone and it's going to take ambient scans of your of your area. And so your color, like all that felt like Star Trek, you know, babble speak to me. Um, but I do think that that whole idea of we're going to take this whole messy user experience of calibrating your TV and simplify it to you felt very Apple to me. I feel like it's going to create a false sense of uh, satisfaction for users. Because, and definitely there's a cognitive dissonance when we talk about Apple marketing and Apple products, because unlike the phone's ability to detect ambient light and then change, for example, uh, the true tone display, the white balance on your phones for daytime and nighttime, there you're talking about the camera and the display being married one to one and the display being small the lighting conditions in people's home environments unless you have a dedicated home theater are widely varied from you know rooms in the living rooms with outdoor light with uh, tungsten light with spillover light from all sorts of light sources you know it, regardless of how much calibration you can do it's not going to be active calibration because Time of day changes as you're watching your shows, you know, and the sun is setting into golden hour, uh, and you're maybe turning on your indoor lights. That's it's not going to be an active thing. And two, this is just on the Apple TV itself, so it's not even changing your real settings on the TV, and that's where things really matter, right? And on the, the on the real granular levels, when you're talking about the contrast settings and all all the things, all the all the minutia that people on the AVS forums can constantly change, you're not going to get any of that. It just makes perhaps your Apple TV experience slightly more comforting in your head that you're getting your best, quote unquote, best quality experience. And there has been, I mean, I'm not saying it's not necessary. There has been some kind of differentiating um, uh, quality of experience between uh, what you get out of HDMI on the Apple TV and what you get, for example, on a Samsung or LG TV, just loading up the Apple TV app. Because now, you know, Apple TV, like that, that functionality is integrated into iTunes and iMovies, all integrated into uh, a lot of third party TVs. And so you can watch your Ted Lasso subscription uh, or whatever you purchase on iTunes natively. And people have noticed, like, the, the, the color resolve is different uh, on those native apps than they are necessarily out of HDMI. So, you know, some consistency there would be better. Um, we're, we're, you're right. It's all about the remote. Thankfully, the remote is. Sold separately. We don't know if it'll be in short supply, but it'll be 60 bucks, which the fact that that is a no brainer also speaks to the cognitive dissonance and how eager and how poor the previous remote, because $60, you know, isn't cheap for an accessory, right? Logitech tried to build a whole business selling remotes and they had to shut down the Harmony business this past year because that's a tough business to be in. And the fact that Apple can get Every Apple TV owner eager and chomping at the bit to put down 60 bucks to buy a new remote. I mean, that speaks to one, the the reality distortion field of Apple, but two, just how poorly received that second uh, that previous remote was. Yeah, I mean, we could spend a lot of time on this and, and we won't. <laughs> but the Harmony remote interface was always just a slog. Yeah. Um, like I felt like I was entering like the registry on my Windows computer when I was programming <laughs> Harmony remotes. It was not fun. And then, uh, and then the other thing is, I do think the the Google Chromecast remote ha- has forced their hand. Like the, you know, there's a lot of limitations on that Chromecast product, but the best thing about it is that remote. So uh, I think this is an inevitability, and I'm glad that Common Sense won. Now, I, I want to go go on to like the third product that I think really stood out to me. Oh, go ahead. I will. I will. So one last thing on the remote, and and we're going to talk about AirTags. I'm shocked that there's no speaker on the remote or. U1 chip in the remote, and I can excuse the U1 because of, of what they're positioning that hardware to be. But the fact that that the remote doesn't beep or allow you to trigger it to beep, so you can find it lost in your couch cushion, I think is it a is bad design. And two, I'm curious whether that click wheel, if it's just clicky directions or if it's like old iPhone style scroll wheel on or iPod style scroll wheel, which I would prefer for easy scrolling uh, across uh, scrubbing across video yeah so you're totally right about the the locate devices especially given the context of this but my third best product is not the air tags it's actually it's the ipod pro i mean putting like the m1 chip ipad pro is is yeah the ipad pro like with the m1 chip was was kind of revolutionary for apple 
last year and seeing it integrated in the iPad Pro and what that's going to make uh, possible is fantastic. Uh, and so th there wasn't many new like features unlocked. It's just better performance, better graphics performance across the suite of apps. And I actually thought the part of the presentation that convinced me, even though it's all you know sales and marketing, I get that, is when they had so many third party groups come in and talk about what M1 allows them to do, like in seeing, you know, Final Cut Pro, like the Photoshop people, the, you know, all these different productivity apps in the context of, of art, video, uh, and whatnot coming together to, to really say like, Hey, this is a big deal. I was like, yeah, maybe this is a big deal. Um, for like photo editing, processing and video editing and processing. I completely agree that M1 and which is really just kind of a, it, it's an evolution uh, in their trajectory of their designing their ARM-based hardware, and obviously a massive jump because it was designed for their MacBooks first, and now it's in their their uh, iMac as well. Uh, the bigger thing is that now you have this parity between the iPad Pro hardware, and and you may get like you know unlock cores and and maybe slightly different TDP caps, uh, but the uh, tablet hardware, touchscreen first tablet hardware, and no aggressively no touchscreen keyboard uh, cursor first MacBook hardware. Like the MacBook Air and MacBook Pro 13 inch and iMac have essentially the same hardware platform as the iPad from maybe different amounts of RAM, again, maybe different TDP, but you're but there's no cross compatibility with the app. You're still asking an Adobe to make a Mac OS app with ARM, running for ARM, optimized for ARM on Mac, and then also an iOS version of the application. Now there may be some benefits in working in on the you know on the development side on the SDK to to make those apps, but just from a user interface, this screams you know a, a foretelling of convergence at some point that there's either going to be and and. I, Emulation is probably not the way to go because Google's tried it, Microsoft's tried it on you know the tablet style hardware, but it's some type of convergence with iOS and macOS down the line. But Apple's happy right now selling two different pieces of hardware, one touchscreen on the iPad, one keyboard and cursor on macOS with the same internal manufacturing efficiency, but charging you know a thousand plus dollars and hoping people buy both of them. And many people are buying both of them. That's crazy when Microsoft is, you know, struggling to sell one of those in a Surface style device. Yeah, I I, I get that. I am intrigued by the 10,000 mini LEDs and getting to this, what I think, what do they call it? XDR brightness. Um, like, you know, putting aside again, all the, the tech babble speak, I'm very interested to see what the display looks like in the in sort of the real world. Is it really going to bring that kind of brightness and contrast ratio that they were they were really spending a lot of time uh, hyping up? And I think that's important for certain segments of the pro user base. Um, and there were reports just last month that they were having some real supply chain issues with mini this, LEDs. Uh, yeah, with mini LEDs. So I'm very curious, also how many of these are actually going to be able to be shipped by the date that, that they actually talked about because a thousand nits of brightness is like tanning yourself brightness uh, off a screen. So yeah, yeah. that is um, like potentially really intriguing. Uh, you know, iPad skipped over OLEDs. They went straight from high quality and their LCDs have been great, but LCDs have, they, they, I mean, for, for video content, for watching, high hdr video the oled at least on the big screen the oled experience and oled on laptops has is far surpassed what you get on an lcd so it's really interesting that they went for oled on the phone side the laptops still are on lcds and now the tablets are where they're building in again the supply chain expertise and all the efficiencies so that mini leds which is what they're investing in can trickle to the other platforms. And so the rumors are the MacBook Pro 14 inch and 16 inch that will probably get some version of the M1 chip later this year will maybe have a mini LED display. So, but you're right, I wanna see this in person. This is why you know the world being open again and Apple stores being open again or Best Buy's being open again becomes way more interesting from a curiosity standpoint because I don't wanna buy this sight unseen when you're talking about the display being such a big selling point on the iPad. So iPad Pros, both sizes updated, 
they have the lidar you know camera arrangement in the back uh but i think the big jump on the ipad pros happened in that fall of 2018 and um with these thousand dollar tablets there's no read to buy, no need to buy them every year you know I, i'm gonna wait probably for, for <laughs> next two generations before considering uh, not at all if you have an ipad pro there i don't imagine buying this as an upgrade but if you are in the market for an ipad pro now that there's the m1 chip in it well that's an interesting um purchase then all of a sudden i mean there's lots of little things they added that i feel like are like yeah sure like two terabytes of storage all that kind of stuff um i'm not convinced about this ultra wide uh camera on the ipad pro really meaning a lot they they made a deal about this like motion tracking camera that can zoom in and out which is a feature that exists on other systems um i will shout out the fact that apple has been leading the way on uh using recycled uh, materials or at least recovering rare earth metals in this uh and they did confirm they're switching over to um uh, tin in their solder on the board in the iPad, which I think like 10 of their other products already does. Uh, and I'm just mentioning that because today is Earth Day, if you're listening to this when the podcast releases. So it's important to note. It's absolutely worth mentioning, you know, as much credit as they get for moving toward more sustainability with these, this, this is, it's, it's a, <sighs> big big problem that we are just at the cusp of feeling but it's been obviously you know it, it's been bubbling everywhere and 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 they should not get credit for pushing consumer culture where people are buying you know attempted to buy new hardware every year you know we can talk about the excitement in terms of the research and i know that's what sustains them being a trillion dollar company uh, and paying for you know hopefully cool things like uh ar um in in the future but you don't need to buy a new new tablet every year you know you don't need to buy a new iphone every year technically i I remain unsold on them trying to push 5g uh especially when they're like pushing it while on a ferry and they're like (laughs) if you're in the right spot you can get you know millimeter wave wave uh uh you know uh signal and it's like you're literally advertising the the place where you're not going to get that signal so uh, i i remain unconvinced about um 5g being an important component with where the the infrastructure needs to be around 5g for that to be really useful for most ipad pro users yeah all right it's time wait, wait, we wait, have no, to talk about we'll, it. we'll talk about oh. two, two other things just before we talk about air tags okay a uh, new color for the iphone whoopie whoop de doo what purple color yeah it's nah. purple that's yeah, great whatever uh imax um good for families i guess it's the 24 inch model Thirteen hundred dollars again. M1 chip. This is the first tether. You know, you, it doesn't run on a battery. Obviously, the new form factor looks fine. The colors look very, you know, pastelly and pleasing. The fact that there's a touch I, ID I on the be... keyboard is nice for user multiple users. It's a family computer. Yeah, I wouldn't knock the form factor as much as you. I think it being thin and having a low profile, uh, a relatively smaller profile for a desk is great. It, it, it fits in with the minimalist architecture that apple's been moving towards with these imax for a while you know the color the color's never been my thing in apple across any generation yeah but i do think touch id i like the ethernet port on the actual brick instead of you know in the thing to simplify some some cable management very microsoft surface Uh, yeah very much like (laughs) you know like a lot of things with apple they they didn't invent it they just made the user experience around it better yeah Uh, it's so thin. It looks like a just you know like an iPad, but an iMac form factor, right? It's like the the headphone jack had to be on the side because it, it's it's not thick enough to have a three point five TRS TRS, you know, on, on the back of it. Uh, it's interesting that they didn't put in more kind of more features to make it more of a u- like useful in the center of a living space. Like in their minds, is this something that lives in a uh, an office or a kids? bedroom or something that lives in the living room or kitchen because the touch id aspect of it tells me this is something for a family to share around and but obviously no touch screen and that would be that's that's what the kids want and no heavy you know airpods slash siri like features to make it more of a home hub um i, I see that as a missed opportunity or you know a, a swivel display a, a, a something that makes it less of just a rigid form factor hmm. yeah all right, we're down to the last two. And okay. these are the ones where there's complicated feelings. 
Uh, Air tags. Uh, I was here last week talking about this is the one I'm excited about. I'm excited about elements of Air tags after seeing them in the wild. Like this is something I would purchase. So I will upfront say I've been a tile user and like the tile like uh, components. I've actually recovered an item I've lost using uh, a tile. So uh, I'm convinced about the power um, of of these devices. It's using ultra wideband. Um, and because of the the network of all the Apple devices out there, you p- potentially have the ability to um, uh, to find uh, your device with the AirTag in a way that other uh, you know giant networks of devices may not be able to to help you. I think those are absolute no brainers about this. Uh, at its price, it's twenty nine dollars, which is pretty much equivalent to the price of of, of Tile. Um, but this isn't a game changer by any stretch of the magic. This is a product that's already on the market in a lot of other ways. The one thing I really liked about AirTags, really, really liked about them, is I like their holders. Um, oh, like co- the whoa, leather whoa, whoa. holder. This is controversy. Design. This is super. Come this on. is the con- controversy. Uh, let's take a step back uh, yeah. because you're a tile user. So your, your yeah. experience on this type of tracking system um, is what? iOS users for a large part, even though iOS is compatible. Find My is a open, it, it, other tile type trackers, Bluetooth trackers can tap into the Find My app, but the vast majority of iOS users and iPhone users have not used this. So walk me through it for four pack, right? Four pack for hundred dollars, I think is for Apple's price skewing is aggressively priced. I think people were kind of shocked by that. If people are buying a pack of four, what are they using this for? What are the four things they're putting this on? So I um I bought like a two pack of tiles and I put one in my wallet and one in on my keychain. Um and then I didn't end up liking the one in my wallet just because it didn't like ever feel right in my wallet, uh, and put it inside my backpack where I have my laptop. Um, but really like most people use this on their keys and either their wallet or backpack of some kind. Those are the primary devices that get tile attachment. I've seen people adapt tile to use on like the remote control. Um, but I, you know, like that makes no sense in the context of what Apple is doing because they want you to buy the Apple TV, which should be able to ring your, your remote at some point. But it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't it ring doesn't. your remote. Uh, I understand why they didn't want to, make the remote either more expensive or put tracking in the remote because the idea is that this is supposed to be tracking things that get moved around uh, but not like not necessarily even on your person so a couple interesting things it's fascinating this whole tile thing it's like it's a category that i really don't think is it's searching for the the use case for almost because of the, the form factor um one i've completely fully believe that it is a it is a metaverse play. The more things they have, mm-hmm. right? People are saying, okay, yeah, iPhone 11s and 12s have the UN chip. And so we have this precise tracking of uh, iOS devices, kind of this mapping of where things are. But when you're talking about potentially every iPhone and iOS user having multiple over time, many more of these air tags just seeding and locked into things, it anchors these things in the world where whenever they put out their AR glasses or even pass through glasses, you get augmented information over useful things and you might not necessarily need augmented information over your Apple TV remote but you might want information over you know your refrigerator or wherever they want you to put these tiles as more as beacons for places where then you can associate metadata and have a visual overlay that's the play here ultra wideband precision is there a, is is there a competitive advantage over a Bluetooth tracker, mm-hmm. and the fact that it's low power? Uh, the user replaceable battery is a definitely a plus here. It uses a CR twenty thirty two, and if you're like me and you went through life not knowing that a CR twenty thirty two is twenty millimeters wide and three point two millimeters thick, congratulations! What really? That's what that means. I did not oh know that watch batteries. That's that's how they're coded. The four-digit number, the first two numbers, is how many millimeters wide diameter, and the last two numbers is a thickness indicator. Huh. If you learn something I, every day. So user replaceable <laughs> battery is yeah, great. I that's mean, good. We can't leave, leave this without acknowledging that they've been sued 
uh, like by Tile and other and like Samsung, I think, brought a complaint too about opening up Find My to third party devices. So this is an ongoing co- uh, controversy. I do think the biggest play they made here is them saying privacy, privacy, privacy. Yes. Throughout this presentation. And those are the two. Uh, so bad thing, no key ring. Like that is an aggressively yeah. Apple dogmatic piece of design where I don't know if it's because aesthetically it doesn't fit into the form factor. They would have that little teardrop bulge to make room for the key ring or the fact that you know the marketing people are, and looked at, okay, we're going to not make as much money on the hardware by selling these at four for a hundred. So we got to make money on accessories. And so here's a $30 uh Leather, not even leather, plastic satchel you can put these in, or a three hundred dollar Hermes one that you can put it in. That's crazy. That's aggressively, I think. It's Apple. super Apple. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not even say anti consumer. Just aggressively Apple in that thinking. But the privacy thing is also aggressively Apple, and the way they're implementing that because they said very upfront, not meant to be put on people or even animals, and. That's where people are like, I want to put this on my dog to track where my where my pet is, or I want to put it on my kid and put it in their backpack. Uh, they have algorithms to detect whether this is on a person or not, and they will alert people if you have a tile on your person, if you have an air tag on your person, and it's not your air tag. So no MacGyver Good. style spy, you know, spy plot device where someone puts an air tag in your pocket or in your backpack and can track you. I, I say good to that. I thought the privacy stuff was spot on. And I wonder how much learning they've garnered from the from the COVID app they uh, framework that they they partnered with Google on. Yeah. I, so the accessories. So I have had tile for years. I have hated the keyhole ring on my tile. Really? It really makes it, it like I know a lot of people like it. I personally have hated it because the tile will get stuck on different key rigs. Um, it just doesn't like rotate smoothly and you can, this might be just my experience, but it's been terrible. And so I actually don't mind that they built a different accessory. What I mind is how much it is, but I think it actually looks better than if they tried to put a, like a hole on the device somehow. Hmm. Uh, and so I don't mind the leather one. I'm not buying a $300 Hermes leather holder for my air air tag, but I imagine there's going to be some, you know, uh, third party versions of the AirTag holder that are going to be leather that look good, that copy this. I mean, it is my one complaint about tiles. Tiles are ugly. They have always been ugly. And Apple has solved, quote, like a question mark. The um, fact uh, any other company issue. would have bundled in a, a, a slip case for this. And the fact that a yeah. case, a silicone case costs $30 for this is so apple there's going to be you know hundreds of companies and a whole cottage industry of of startups creating tile you know holders right wristband tile things tile tile pouches with you know uh, uh, all sorts of doodads and, and functionality um you know patterns that you can buy so you can kind of laser cut your own pouch so whatever um i'm still unconvinced about the practical use case before we have ar and real, you know, kind of metaverse implications for these. Uh, but at that price, it's going to be it's going to be a thing that kids love to showing each other off at school. I have the new Apple thing for twenty five to twenty nine dollars, um, and that type of power they have is just you know only Apple has that type of market power. Um, just okay. no poop, no poop emoji uh, no, being yeah. engraved on mine. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. You can engrave emoji. Ah, okay. Uh, so podcasts, is that the last one? Yeah. Yeah. Subscriptions on podcasts. Who uses the Apple podcast app? I'm still a pocket cast guy. Um, it's not, gonna I get use pocket cast as, as well. Um, I, I think the revamp is overdue. The subscriptions is interesting for two levels. So obviously Apple is going to take a cut. What that number is matters a lot. Probably going to be 30% if we know Apple, um, that's a huge chunk of money if you're not a giant podcast, um, if you're a podcast network. So um, that it might be more tenable. The second thing is, what are they going to do with podcast metrics uh, behind the scenes? They, you, they did not talk about this, but this is 
definitely an area Apple has hated about podcasts. And they've been very overt that they feel like podcast metrics have been totally messed up. And it's true. But I do think this is a way for them to start to standardize some elements around what it what it means uh, for podcasts, because downloads has been the typical way that yeah. podcasts are measured, yeah. which are terrible ways of measuring listenership. Um, it, because you... Yeah, it it just doesn't. It's like it's like paying for uh, it, like complete streams, which is is not kind of how it's done. So I'm curious if they're going to reinvent podcast metrics as part of this revamp. Other people have tried to solve this problem. I mean, it, the, the fundamental problem comes with the fact that podcasts stemmed out of RSS, and RSS can't doesn't have that deep layer of tracking. So you have to build into a distribution platform uh, or the playback application itself. Uh, if, if you're a big podcast network and you've had success on Patreon or, or, or your own crowdfunding campaigns or your own platform for subscriptions, right, what is the incentive to jump on Apple and give them a cut uh, when, you know, when most people are happy and fine, you have a really good relationship with your users directly. So unless Apple is providing direct incentives for podcasters to really try to sell subscriptions uh, on on their network, um, it, I don't see that. I don't it, like. I, I see Amazon doing a better job with their Audible stuff by putting you know Audible subscriptions and paying for great you know auto, Audible type podcast series and even Spotify you know purchasing and buying relationships with podcasts as a way to boost their subscription system. Uh, this being, I'm surprised it's not a bigger part of the Apple like Apple One and Apple Apple Music subscription service. Yeah, it, like this is one of those that it could be easily forgotten in a month. We're like, you remember when? Um, or it could end up being part of something bigger down the road. Yeah. It's, it's hard to tell because they didn't have somebody come out and talk about podcasts. They had like Tim Cook do it. And yeah. I thought that was strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. That's all the Apple stuff. It's a lot of Apple stuff. Uh, but we do have a little bit more to talk about before you have the Jekka store. So before we move on to our next segment, I want to let you know, remind you that this episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Storyblocks. We all know that video is the most effective way to capture someone's attention. And the so storytellers of today are challenged to creating more video content at a higher quality than ever before. Thankfully, Storyblocks makes it easy to keep up with the growing demands of modern video content so you can bring all your stories to life and stop sacrificing your vision due to time, budget, or resources. Every creator should try a Storyblocks membership. And with affordable subscriptions, you can stay on budget while telling the best version of your story. Storyblocks has a growing library of over 1 million high-quality stock assets, including 4K footage, After Effects and Premiere Pro templates, music images, sound effects, and more. And the assets are royalty-free. And with the unlimited all-access plan, you get unlimited downloads of everything in the Storyblocks library. If you're a member of a large creative team, marketing agency, or a media organization, Storyblocks has your back with comprehensive coverage for your entire company and enables you to distribute wherever, whenever. Learn more and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Once again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. Ooh, okay. We have just a couple things to talk about. Shall we do a recap of Falcon Winter Soldier? Yeah, let's do hit, five hit, minutes. Hit, hit that spoiler light. Let's Boom. get into it. We're going to roll into it Boom. right away. Spoiler light is on. Now that is a cameo. <laughs> that is how you do a cameo. That's what I have to say. Wow. Blew me away with that cameo. Blew you away as a Marvel fan because we didn't know this is where... like. What I'm realizing now is these shows serve multiple purposes. One, they are a great way to flesh out you know, backstory and character that you wouldn't – for characters that wouldn't get the spotlight in a two-hour movie. Um, and it, Long form storytelling, great for MCU, it turns out. Uh, two, they're really setting up other – just like the movies set up other movies, they're other setting up other, other TV shows or setting up other movies themselves. Just like WandaVision sets up Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness. Here, with the appearance of uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus, big spoiler cameo, uh, that's going to set up, you know, 
what what do you think it is like thunderbolts yeah i mean my first reaction was this is going to set up thunderbolts which is like an anti avengers team that's under the direction of thunderbolt ross it's why long at the beginning of the series i said i was looking for william hurt um in this in this series um but it could also just as easily based on her character set up something with secret invasion because that character in the comics has a lot of relations uh with nick fury yeah. um so i i think it could go in a couple directions there um i this is the was the best episode of the series um and likely will end up being the best episode of the series because it's gonna be hard for them to stick the landing and uh, I think you said it best, Norm, uh, over Slack um, when we were talking about this. Is like the best moments of this episode is when there wasn't action happening. There were the so best many moments of the show, and the action yeah. is great. But the best moments of the show is just them fixing a boat, a boat fixing yeah. montage. Those are the. That's what I want. I, I will say, Carl Lumbly, just a just iconic in this role. I. Like I both want more of him because Carl Lumbly is just great, um, and I, but I don't want more of him because I feel like there was resolution at, at least a little bit in that scene. Um, uh, though I don't think we're done with uh, Carl's family uh, yeah. by any stretch of the imagination, but that's coming down the line. Uh, he's Captain America now. Like, yeah, we yeah. saw it. Yeah, he's I mean, transformed. Yeah, yeah, and believable. Um, that transformation, and- that internal struggle, that whole conversation with Isaiah Bradley. Uh, served a really great narrative purpose where he, they didn't have to agree. They empathized with each other and you saw you, they they pulled back the curtain on you know the dark realities of the history of the MCU, but ended up at a place where it's still, I mean, Bucky waking up and seeing, you know, um, uh, Sam Wilson's nephews playing with the shield that that was one of the best scenes and shots in in the the series and in the MCU and that resonated with you know that that explains why he still feels like it's worth picking up the shield yeah i i, I will say it was a little bit heavy handed but i also appreciated sam giving the tough love to bucky um because it sets up bucky's conclusion yeah. in the series and maybe his conclusion in the MCU um if it's if they really <laughs> take it to to the right way think about that that therapy session where it's a training ahead of before the training montage where sam is doing his rocky you know getting stronger throwing the shield where they're just casually playing catch with cap shield with these pads wrapped around trees and having their like you know a a ptsd conversation and a conversation what captain america means like this is this is what some of the best stuff that was in Winter Soldier, the movie, it was some of the best stuff that was, uh, yeah, really, like, you know, um, all that, it works best in comics, right? In, in the pages where you have, you know, a, a, a Brian Michael Bendis style nine page, nine, nine panel array where it's just dialogue, right? Not every beat has to be about action. And there's going to be action. I think it's going to suffer the same thing that WandaVision suffered in their final episode where it needs a big fight. Um, but the penultimate episodes, they really, they really nailed it. Yeah. I mean, there's no way they're going to nail the costume that's in my head after that scene. There's no way they can nail this fight. Cause I actually, I still think the flag smashers piece of this is yeah. the weakest part of the entire series. Um, and we have kind of like a forced fight here coming at the end. Um, but I, I think I am most excited about Bucky's resolution here. Mm. Um, after all, because the transformation for Sam has happened. Uh, so now it's really, can they nail Bucky's resolution? Uh, and I still think we have a lingering, you know, unsatisfying how we've gotten here, who the power broker is that right. may get answered. Please don't be Sharon. Please don't be Mephisto. Let's make it something interesting. Oh, I interesting. think we know who it is. I think I know who it is. Who, who, who do because you- it leads into our into our next topic well oh oh, 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 interesting interesting um and that's interesting in terms of the uh julie drevis cameo is that this was supposed to be set up as the second appearance because we would have theoretically maybe seen her in uh, a a movie that was an mcu movie that was supposed to come out last year uh but it still works regardless being first or second appearance because fans are savvy they're going to be explainer articles and you know she has enough presence uh, as an actor, that is just a fun cameo uh, to have. Uh, there's a mid-credit scene. You know, again, so much to pack in in this last episode coming up this week. So, 
I don't I'm think done with that MCU. Guy. I'm you don't, done you don't with think, him. I, I think there's we'll probably see Wyatt Russell in future MCU stuff. I don't think I don't think it's going to be a sacrifice. You, you think? No, you think I, he's done? I agree with you. Okay, I okay. think I, it, the Thunderbolt thing it seems like the way they're going. Yeah. Now yeah. that may not show up in a movie, but mm. I don't think we're done with him at the end of this series. Yeah. Yeah. Zemo uh, also but, at the raft. The raft run by uh, William Hurt. Thunderbolt Ross also. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's talk about the trailer for Shang Chi, um, which was I thought excellent um, and kind of a surprise trailer, and that's why I, I think it has some linkages to Falcon and Winter Soldier. There's you don't drop a trailer three days before the conclusion of a series unless there's something there. I might be overreading it, but uh, I, I thought the the action sequences that we got um, really kind of fit the story. They really positioned the Mandarin in a way in that, in that trailer that makes sense. Um, like a re envisioning of what is in the comics, which is not possible to be translated to the screen. Yeah. Um, as his father, um, it, it feels a little like going back to phase one of Marvel though. That's, that's exactly. Like, yep. Standalone, you know, I'm sure all the hidden ties to the MCU will be revealed, but the fact that it looks like it's going to be fun as a standalone superhero action movie, I'm, I'm, Super down for that. I think not only is the Mandarin a, a tough translation from the origins of the comics, but Shang Chi himself is you know is born out of just the popularity of martial arts movies and kind of like you know Marvel's Bruce Lee, uh, and and to modernize that and to make it again about familiar relationships and relate, relatable things not only for you know the Asian community but for you know any 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 kid with a <laughs> overbearing father, <laughs> um, that that I think will be fun and you know, Aquafina is always fun. Yeah, a, a couple of sort of like slightly deeper cuts. I like how like literally people are wearing the rings as mm. uh, as a representation of the Ten Rings. Um, I We seem to get like flashback sequences that um, that will illustrate the Mandarin's history um, in, in like dec- in centuries ago that I think is interesting. And I think we, like the reason I think and I'm just going to say it. I think the Mandarin is the power broker. I think the reason I believe that is. Uh, there's a couple shots in the trailer that I think are in Madripoor. Um, oh. so, and I was like, that's uh, like, they have that kind of like neon vibe that we saw in the, yeah. in the show. So it's like, I uh, like what, like, that's the only reason I think that, um, uh, but I, I'm excited about this movie. Everything seems uh, on point. The effects seem on point. Some of the CD didn't seem totally finished, polished. Um, but you know, they have time to, to fix that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, shall we do a very quick moment of science to talk about uh, what happened off world this past week? All right. Let's quickly yep. play the cue. Now it's time for a moment of science. Uh, I'm going to read a quote um, from Mimi Ong. Each world only gets one first flight. That comes from the director of the team that led Ingenuity, which this week flew a couple meters off the surface of Mars um, and landed back down. Uh, It's not impressive from when you describe it that way. But when you see, I was watching the live stream. 3 a.m. Pacific. 3.15 to 3.00, I think it was like 3.36 uh, a.m. Pacific. But when you see the shot from Ingenuity of it looking down towards the ground and you see its own shadow, it's just cool. We just flew an, uh, a rotocraft on another planet. That That's mind-blowing. No, th- nothing else much to say uh, and, beyond it's like, what an achievement. <laughs> and the fact that it's the first and the successful flight, it allows our imagination as readers of science fiction. I mean, it really is a direct tie to like almost a Jules Verne, like – you know, imagining of what we can do on other worlds, um, that we can not only land things there, but also deploy and fly on other worlds. And the atmosphere is different, and you know, the gravity is different, and all those considerations. It's just, it's just, what a what a huge successful day for science. Yeah, awesome. awesome, awesome. I'll, I'll just uh, end quickly by saying um, I, I had a lot of fun on Will's uh, podcast, uh, so you can go to techpod.content.town. I. We did an hour and 15 minutes about COVID. We talked about a lot of issues um, from 
you know, choices to make to what's happening internationally. I, I just want to end by saying like what's happening in India is uh, beyond scary right now. They have uh, the highest per capita cases in the world. It surpassed the peaks that we um, hit in the U.S. a few months ago. So my heart goes uh, out to them. Um, and I really I remain optimistic, uh, but also realistic about the urgency to get vaccines out to everyone as quick as possible. And if you're on the fence about vaccines, that's totally understandable. Uh, talk to people about it. It is the best way to sort of um, uh, work through that because that is um, uh, that is the way uh, that we'll overcome this together. Because uh, every vaccination is a step closer back to a version of normal that. Um, that I think we can all be uh, optimistic for. Well said. All right, uh, we'll do a very quick, maybe VR two minutes. The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. So two big things happening in the uh, Oculus world, at least uh, on the Steam VR side. We have ViveCon coming up in in May, so we're all hoping for new hardware to be announced there. But on the Oculus side, no new hardware, of course. But uh, John Carmack and Boz, who runs the Oculus division over on Facebook, uh, had a, a Twitter conversation and uh, revealing all sorts of interesting insight about their plans for Quest Two and the state of the stuff and a big version twenty eight update that we talked about last week. Upload VR has transcribed that and broken down some of the the, the inter most interesting highlights. Uh, the salient points are uh, they don't anticipate a Quest 2 Pro or Quest Thrust 3 doesn't even exist, but any type of Quest 2 Pro would not be for a long time. Quest 2 for the foreseeable future software updates um, for uh, for existing owners uh, going forward. They talk about, you know, obviously app exclusivity. Uh, we saw the first announcement of the Quest 2 exclusive app. So Quest 1 users won't be able to play Resident Evil 4 being ported over um, by App Armature to uh, to uh, the Quest Two, um, and but they're still going to encourage developers to tap into you know the million owners of Quest One headsets. Um, version twenty eight has been rolling out to a lot of people, although the uh, AirLink uh, functionality is not unlocked yet on the desktop side. You need version twenty eight on the PC and uh, in the public test channel. The version twenty eight does not have it unlocked. Although uh, uh, the one twenty hertz side as an experimental feature is unlocked on version 28 and it's been pushed to virtual desktop as well so if you've been playing games wirelessly on steam vr via virtual desktop you can actually do it at 120 hertz now and there's some great users who've been testing which apps to work best and surprisingly beat saber in game works really well even games like pavlov and um and Gorn work very well at 120 hertz. Although natively, you know, when we talk about what games are going to really benefit, it's of course table tennis. So table tennis, eleven <laughs> table tennis, you know, all that quick response time. Uh, that's native 120 hertz. Uh, if you have version 28, I actually did get V28 unlocked, uh, and Jeremy did as well yesterday. So we're going to save our kind of deep dive and conversation about that for next week. Hopefully, AirLink will be unlocked then. I did buy the Logitech. You know, the K830, oh, you got it already. I got nice. it already. And I will say my quick impressions of the track keyboard, disappointing. Uh, disappointing not yeah, for a version a, one that was going to be hard yeah uh, I'll, I'll dive into i might make a separate video so i can actually try to capture what the headset sees there's some interesting things about it when you have the keyboard track you actually see ghosted hands your hands fading in just around your hands when you're typing on that keyboard but the tracking is jittery it's the the, the rendition of the keyboard is just low frame rate and it is Kind of very disappointing compared to how impressed I was with like hand tracking, for example. I think, but it's not an easy problem to solve. And we'll again I'll talk about it maybe in a separate video or a deeper dive. Uh, one last thing: there was an Oculus Game Showcase. So Resident Evil Four, Lone Echo Two coming this summer. That's going to be a Rift desktop PC still exclusive, not a Quest port for that, which is a surprising thing. Uh, you got ILM doing Tales from Galaxy Edge Part Two, so uh, they're doing um, uh, Part Two. Uh, called Doc Ondar, and that's going to be coming later this year. Star Wars Virtual Pinball VR, and maybe some of the stuff we'll see more on May 4th. Um, 
And we can't talk about that without Jeremy. I know, so. exactly. Uh, and then updates to the Climb 2, so more maps and uh, game features there, as well as an update to Pistol Whip. So you have a, uh, what is this, a Wild West theme pistol, Pistol Whip campaign, and also, uh, what is it, the update to... Uh, Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners. So there's going to be a big update for... Uh, I expect you to die too. Also. Yes, yes. And that will also launch on Quest. So uh, lots of content there. We'll do more deep dives. Again, waiting for Air Link to unlock on the PC side. If you go on the Oculus Quest subreddit, there is a direct link for in their sticky thread if you want to force the side load of the version 28 if you don't have that yet yeah. uh, and some instructions on how to do and, that. And it's worth saying that... Uh, we know about the Magic Leap announcement that there's going to be a new headset a few months away. And I think that'll uh, something to talk about for next week as well. Yeah. Awesome. All right. We got through it this week. I am going to collapse. I'm going to try to recover. Uh, there's no rest. No rest. No rest. Uh, expect. I think we're going to do a 3D printing video up on the site this week. Uh, but we, of course, have more 1A builds, more uh, tool tips, more show and tell on the site. Thank you for listening and subscribing. Sure. Thanks for joining me. This week, getting toward getting toward May. Can't wait for that second shot. Can't wait for that second yeah. shot. I told you. <laughs> I told you. And then it'll be time for Black Widow before oh, you know. Oh my God! All right. Uh, do we do? Let's do an. Uh, let's do this outro. This is an, as I say, on Back to the Future, an oldie, but a goodie. Uh, we'll see you next week. Hi there. I didn't see you. <laughs>I finished the leftovers. Ugh, too bad for you. Um, what? <laughs> I haven't watched a single episode. Just I know so many people that don't like that. Oh, no, whoa, whoa, no. If you are interested, if you like Lost, but were disappointed by the ending, watch Leftovers. I swear to God, I thought he was talking about yesterday's Mexican food. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> That's, it. That's why I miss podcasting in person. Yeah, Can't have real I also just missed Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you next week.